Good evening. So today's uh, discussion will be on translation. So to get started, to get started, we can uh, define what translation is. So translation is uh, another term is just simply protein synthesis. So this is where amino acids are assembled into a polypeptide chain based on uh, genetic information carried by uh, the, uh, the mRNA molecule, which was synthesized during transcription. And if you remember from the transcription process, this mRNA molecule was synthesized using a DNA template strand. So to define uh, translation, we would say it's a process in which amino acids are assembled into polypeptides based on genetic information carried by mRNA derived from DNA. So the mRNA will carry the message from DNA and that message will be interpreted into uh, a, a protein by the translation uh, machinery. So if we remember again, there's three types of uh, mRNA. There are more, but uh, the important ones for the process of translation are the mRNA, the rRNA, and the tRNA. So all these we interact in order to synthesize the protein that's coded for by the DNA. So in this slide, we can see the structures of uh, we can see the structures of mRNA uh, of RNA uh, up here, up here where the pointer is. This is. Uh, the mRNA, uh, which is transcribed by eukaryotes. So it will have a five prime end and a three prime end. And then in between it from the transcription process before it, were, it underwent the post-transcription modifications, you'd have exons, introns, exons. And once the splicing process is done, you'd have the mature mRNA where you'd have a five prime cap and the poly A tier, and then you would have uh, the coding sequence here, which contains just the exons. In eukaryotes, you you have the same thing, except you won't have the five prime uh, cup and the poly A tier. So it will just be the way it's synthesized with the coding sequence in between the five prime and translated region and the three prime and translated region. This five prime untranslated region and the three prime untranslated region are also there in the eukaryotic mRNA. It's not shown in this diagram, but you'd have a five prime cup, then you'd have a five prime untranslated region, and then you'd have the coding sequence, the three prime untranslated region, and then you'd have the uh, poly A tail. The other difference between the two uh, MRAs, the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic, is that they also have uh, a sequence in the in the prokaryotic mRNA known as the shine dalgano sequence. So this sequence is important for the initiation of uh, translation in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, this sequence is not needed. Uh, it's one of the differences in the translation process between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. Then down here, uh, you have uh, a ribosome. So the ribosome will have uh, the ribosomal RNA, and then you, you have that ribosomal RNA uh, combining with proteins to form uh, a ribosome, which is where the protein synthesis will occur. So that ribosome, if you remember, they had uh, different, they had two subunits, a large subunit and a smaller subunit. The large subunit was a 50S and the smaller subunit was a 30S. Uh, that's in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, uh, you had the large subunit being a 60S and the smaller subunit being a 40S. Uh, the whole size for the ribosome in prokaryotes was 70S, whereas in eukaryotes, it was uh, 80S. When you look at the large subunit on its own, uh, 
you'll find that in its structure, it will contain uh, compartments uh, that take part in the translation process. So these compartments, you would have the first compartment, which is known as the amino acyl uh, site. And then you would have the second compartment known as the peptide uterine binding site. And then you would have the third compartment known as the exit site. So these compartments, we'll see how uh, they play a role in the translation process. The third RNA was the tRNA, uh, which had uh, the clover, the clover leaf shape uh, and four arms. So it had the amino acid or acceptor arm. Then it had the T arm, the D arm, and the anticodon arm. And we mentioned uh, that to say the anticodon arm is what will bind to the mRNA. And then you have the uh, amino acid arm or the acceptor arm, which would have, which should have at it uh, an amino acid, and that this uh, amino acid arm or acceptor arm would always end in the sequence CCA. Uh, one other thing worth noting on the tRNA uh, is a process known as tRNA charging, the process by which the very amino acid attached to the amino acid arm, the way it gets attached to that amino acid arm is by the process known as tRNA charging. And once that amino acid is attached to this three prime end of the tRNA, this tRNA now uh, is now known as a charged tRNA. So the way this happens is that you'd have an amino acid and this amino acid, uh, you'd have a phosphate group added to it by um, an amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Once that amino, uh, amino group, uh, that uh, phosphate group is added, so this phosphate group would be adenosine monophosphate. So you'd have a tRNA coming. From the tRNA, you'd remove two phosphate groups, many with the... Uh, adenosine monophosphate and that adenosine monophosphate would be added to the would be added to the amino acid so that amino acid uh, now becomes uh, an amino acyl adenylate which is what is shown here so you have an amino acid attached to an adenosine monophosphate and this uh, amino acyl adenylate by the same enzyme again, the amino acid tRNA synthetase, it would add that to the three prime end of the tRNA, forming what is known as a charged tRNA. So now that we've uh, we, we've familiarized ourselves with the uh, structures of the RNA molecules involved in the translation process, Another concept we can look at is what is known as the genetic code. So uh, if you look at uh, the diagram here where the pointer is, you have this DNA strand. This DNA strand will have uh, bases, to have bases in it. And those bases are what to code for the, for the, uh, for the polypeptide. So this sector of the DNA molecule that codes okay so uh just in case i might not see your message if you've got a question you can unmute yourself and ask so someone is asking in the section in the chat saying uh what is the yellow part on the tRNA? Go back to this slide. Okay. So the yellow part in this tRNA is what is known as the variable arm. So this section, uh, it will it will uh, it will be present in tRNAs, but it will be varying structure. So it's known as a variable arm. So we'll move on. We're talking about the genetic code. So in the genetic code, you have this DNA strand, which is the template strand from which you 
form the mRNA strand. So this DNA strand has those bases that, that through complementary base pairing, we end up uh, synthesizing the uh, RNA strand there. So this section of DNA, which will be responsible, this section which contains the uh, nucleotide bases, which will be, will be interpreted into a polypeptide chain, this section of the DNA is what will be known as a gene. And then you have this group of uh, bases. So for each, uh, for the three, like once you count one, two, three on the bases, those three bases, the triplet uh, nucleotide bases, I want to be known as a, a codon. So you have, uh, you have the whole section of bases divided into three. And that whole section, the three, the groups of the triplet uh, nucleotide bases, what would be known as the genetic code. So for the definition, for the genetic code, you could simply just say it's the sequence of nucleotides in DNA or RNA that determines the amino acid sequence of proteins. Whereas a code is just a, uh, a sequence of three DNA or RNA nucleotides that corresponds to a specific amino acid or a stop signal. This brings us to the next uh, section, which will be on the features of the genetic code. Uh, this here is just the genetic code. This is the genetic code. Uh, so you have those codons, the triplet nucleotides, a, a sequence of uh, three uh, RNA or DNA nucleotides. So this genetic code could either be based off the mRNA or based off the DNA template strand from which the mRNA was, uh, was uh, synthesized. So the features of the genetic code, uh, eight of them. So the first one is that it's universal, meaning all organisms who use the same genetic code. So meaning it's the same in all uh, organisms. It doesn't change. It's not like there'll be uh, this sequence of bases uh, that are coding for this amino acid in this organism and you have uh, this same sequence of bases coding for another amino acid in uh, another organism. By it being universal, what it simply means is that that very sequence will code for the same amino acid in bacteria, it will code for the same amino acids in humans. So in eukaryotic, in the prokaryotic, it's the same for all organisms. Then the second one is that the genetic code is, is a triplet, meaning it's made up of uh, codons, those uh, sequences of three nucleotide bases. That's what this means. Then you move on to the next one, which says it's covalent. So what this simply means is that uh, along the uh, genetic code, the, the mRNA, you have those triplet codons. So what it means to be covalent is that when the sequences, the amino acids, uh, polypeptide chain is being formed, you won't have a situation whereby it treats the first codon, skips a base or two, goes to the next codon, no. So it will be read in a continuous manner. So you read the first three, you read the next three, you read uh, the following three and so on. There'll be no skipping of a base or two and then reading three and so on. So that's what it means when it says uh, the genetic code is covalent. So the fourth is that the genetic code is not overlapping. What this simply means is that you have these bases here, one, two, three, and then you have these one, two, three here. So you cannot have a, uh, a situation where you read a base, say from the first codon, and then continue on to the next two and form another codon. That does not happen. So you read the first three, then move on to the next three. 
you won't borrow a base from the first code dot and combine it with other two to form another code dot. That is what it means to say the genetic code is that of a lapin. The fifth one is that it is an ambiguous. So what this simply means is that each code dot will code for a single amino acid. You won't have this uh, code dot coding for a different amino for two different amino acids. No. So this code dot will always code this one, for example, AUG will always code for methionine. You won't have it code for isoleucine or valine or any other amino acid or coding for both methionine and uh, isoleucine. No. AUG always code for methionine. That is what it means when they say it's unambiguous. So meaning each code dot will code for a single amino acid. The next uh, feature of the genetic code is that it is redundant or it is degenerate. So what this simply means is that you, in the, uh, as mentioned, you have a single code dot coding for a single amino acid. But the other way around is not true. You can have a single amino acid being coded for by many codons. So this is uh, the only exception to that true is methionine. Methionine always be coded by AUG. Whereas the other amino acids, you can have, uh, uh, if we go back to this code here, so you can have uh, leucine here, which will be uh, coded for by UUA and UUG. So this is what it means to be degenerate. You have more than one code that code for the same amino acid. The next one is that uh, the genetic code has what is known as collinearity. So what this simply means is that uh, uh, the genetic code itself will be linear. And the amino acid polypeptide chain, which it codes for, will also be linear. And that's what it simply means here when they say collinearity. Uh, the last one is that of gene polypeptide parity. So what this simply means is that uh, in an organism, you have as uh, many genes as they are polypeptide uh, chains in the organism. So if you've got two genes, those two genes will code for two polypeptide, different polypeptide chains. That's what this last part means when they say gene polypeptide parity. Okay, so that's on the features on, of the genetic code. Uh, so before we move on, are there any questions before we move on? Okay, so as mentioned, uh, one of the features of the genetic code was that it is redundant or degenerate. So this degeneracy is due to what is known as the Wobo effect. So in the Wobo uh, effect, there's what is known as the Wobo hypothesis. So when you look at the tRNA molecule that will have anticodons that will base pair with uh, bases on the mRNA, uh, since the mRNA is running five prime to three prime, the tRNA will be running anti-parallel to this mRNA, five prime to three prime. So at this position, in the tRNA, it will be the first uh, base pair of the anti -codon. In the mRNA, it will be the third base pair. So that position is what is known as the wobble position. So what happens in that position is that you'd have another uh, new nitrogenous base known as uh, inosine. So this ion, uh, inosine 
uh, it's it's uh, not one of the standard nitrogenous bases. And what this ionosine does is that it's able to bind with uh, uracil, it's able to bind with cytosine, it's able to bind with uh, adenine. So when you have that ionosine in that anticodon, down in the mRNA, it can uh, bond with uh, uracil, it can bond with uh, cytosine, and it can bond with uh, adenine. This is what to bring about uh, if I can use uh, isoleucine. Let's see. Where is it in this genetic code? Okay, let me just use this very one. So uh, when you look at uh, 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 leucine here, what you have is that in this third position here, so you have the first two amino acids, uh, UU, UU. So these uh, bind by the standard Watson Creek base pairing, whereas the third one will undergo what is known as the Wobo base pairing with that ionosine, which can bind with either A, G, or U. So you could have a, a there, or you could have a G, and this this code will still code for the same uh, amino acid. That's what will bring about the degeneracy of the genetic code. So now that we've talked about the Wobo hypothesis, we've talked about the structures of the uh, tRNA, the mRNA, and the ribosome. We've also talked about the Wobo hypothesis. We can uh, now get into the translation process. So the translation process, uh, it takes place in three stages, which will be the initiation, the elongation, and the termination. So in the initiation, uh, the end result of the of initiation will be the formation of a initiation complex. So this initiation complex will contain the uh, small subunit of the small subunit of the ribosome. It will contain the mRNA. Then it will also have the large subunit of the of the ribosome. So in short, you have the whole ribosome, the mRNA, and then you also have a charged tRNA. So that complex is what would be known as the initiation complex. So how does this complex form? In prokaryotes, if you remember, along the mRNA, you had what is known as the shine dalgano sequence. So this shine dalgano sequence will always be close to the stack codon. So what will happen is that the small subunit of the prokaryotic uh, ribosome will recognize that shine dalgano sequence, and then it will bind to the mRNA. It will bind to the mRNA, binding both the shine dalgano sequence and the start codon. So once it's bound, you have an initi initiation uh, factor which will bring in the charged tRNA. So the start codon will always be AUG, which codes for methionine. In prokaryotes, it doesn't code for methionine. Uh, the type of methionine the start codon will code for is known as uh, formal uh, methionine or F methionine. So that would be that would be the the tRNA molecule, so it will come there on the start codon, and it will bind. It will bind to the start codon using uh, the complementary base pairing. That charged tRNA will have F met. Once it's bound, the large subunit of uh, the ribosome will come in, and it will bind to the complex as well. So this will bind it. Uh, this whole binding will use energy, and that energy is generated from uh, GTP, guanosine triphosphate. And this GTP will be brought in by the initiation factors. So once, once the large subunit has bound to, to the 
the 30S, the, the 30S, the mRNA and the tRNA complex, that will complete the initiation process. Then now uh, the chain is ready to elongate. This will bring us to the next step in the translation process, the elongation. So if you remember, we said the ribosome will have three compartments in, in it, the large subunit to have the amino acid site, to have the peptide site, and then to have the exit site. So the, in the elongation process, this is where these sites come into play now. So you have you had that methionine uh, bonded to the initiation uh, uh, tRNA, which binds to the start codon. Then now you have another tRNA coming to the A site. So it will read the next three, the next three, the next codon, and the tRNA will bind on that codon uh, using base pairing. That tRNA will be a charged tRNA, meaning it has an amino acid. Once it's bound, the amino acid that's bound to the tRNA uh, in its structure, it has an amino in this side, whereas the, uh, the methylene which was uh, bound, which was bound to the uh, start of uh, at the start of uh, the translation process, while the carboxyl at this end here, where the pointer is. So what will happen is that there'll be a reaction between the amino end of the incoming amino acid and the amino acid already in the peptide uh, in the peptide site. So that reaction will form will form a peptide bond between the two amino acids. So you have this methionine transfer to this tRNA contained in the A site. And what you have is uh, a polypeptide chain which has been uh, elongated by one amino acid. Once it's bound there, what will happen is that this tRNA that's in the A site will now move into the P site. This moving of this tRNA into the P site, and then this one in the P site will move into the E site. So this movement is known as translocation, and it also uses uh, GTP, and this uh, GTP energy uh, is also brought in by elongation factors. So you have uh, the tRNA containing the elongated polypeptide chain move to the P site. Then you have the tRNA that was in the P site. Since it's now lost its amino acid, it's become sort of an empty shell and it moves into the E site. And once in the E site, it moves out of the complex and goes to get charged again, goes to collect another amino acid. This is what this second diagram here is showing. So you have that elongating chain in the in the P site, and you have peptide bonds formed between the amino acids. Then you have another charged uh, tRNA coming to the A site. This one will come in again. Then you have formation of a peptide bond. Uh, this formation of the peptide bond using energy again, uh, and it also will be catalyzed by the enzyme peptide transference. So those, that bond will form again. You have these two transfer to this one in the A site, and then translocation will happen. This tRNA in the A site will move to the P site, and you have that elongated chain. The tRNA that was in the P site will move to the E site, and once in the E site, once in the E site, it will leave, and once it leaves, it goes to get charged again, it comes back, and that is how the elongation will continue happening. So we've elongated, well, we are elongating the chain. So this elongation will continue until the translation apparatus reaches a stop codon. So there are three stop codons, UAA, UAG, and UGA. 
if you want to remember this, you can remember them as you are away, you are God, you go away. So these three are the stop condoms. So these stop condoms don't code for any amino acid. So what happens when the translation apparatus reaches the stop condom? What will happen is that uh, instead of a charged tRNA coming into the complex, what will come in is known as a release factor. So this release factor will come in and it will bind at that stop condom. Once it binds, it tells that enzyme which was making uh, the peptide bonds between the amino acids to instead add the water molecule. And the addition of that water molecule would dissociate the polypeptide chain away from the complex. So uh, you, the polypeptide chain will detach from the complex and leave the complex. Once that happens, the whole translation apparatus would dissociate. So you have the small subunit, leave the complex, you have the large subunit, leave the complex, and then you have the MRI in there, uh, remain as it was. Uh, so what happens to the MRI after it remains is that it will get degraded by nucleases and so on to its uh, basic units, which will then be used in another transcription process and the whole process starts all over again. So in that way, uh, the translation process has terminated and we formed, uh, we formed the polypeptide chain from an RNA molecule. That brings us to the next uh, point. This polypeptide chain that has been freed, some will, some will be ready for use. They'll be functional. Those proteins, the polypeptide chains that have been synthesized, some will be, will be functional, whereas others won't be functional. So those that won't be functional, in order to become functional, they'll undergo post-translational modifications. So these post-translational modifications will include an addition of a functional group. So these functional groups can be an addition of a glucose molecule, you could add the lipid to it, you could add the methyl group to it, uh, you could add the phosphate group. So when you add the glucose group to it, you, it will be known as glycosylation. Uh, when you add the methyl group, it will be methylation. When you add the uh, lipid, it will be lipidation. If you add the phosphate, it will be phosphorylation. So that's the addition of the functional groups. You could also have uh, an instance where the amino acid, uh, the polypeptide amino acid chain is cleaved, where it's just trimmed and some amino acids are removed. So that removal makes some enzymes, uh, such as insulin, which is uh, synthesized in its inactive form. So it will have this long chain of amino acids. Then what you have is that from a certain point to a certain point, this is this point uh, is not necessary to the function of the insulin. And as long as it's there, the insulin will be inactive. So you have enzymes, proteases that will come in and they will cleave there and cleave there. And then you have these two chains form the sulfide bonds and then link up forming the active form of the insulin. So what this simply means, uh, the whole post-translational modifications, the importance is that they'll be important to the folding of certain proteins because the, the functional groups are sort of reactive. They, they will force the polypeptide chain to form. If you remember, it was a linear, a linear molecule that was synthesized and because of uh, those functional groups added, you have those amino acids folded. Then you have some of them, for example, those that were a lipid added to them. So those lipids added to them will give the um, uh, polypeptide chain some sort of affinity where it can go to, uh, uh, to cell membranes, which are made up of lipids, and then it can just uh, insert itself in that, uh, in that cell membrane because it's also made up of lipids. 
uh, as I mentioned, you could also have uh, the polypeptide chain being synthesized in its inactive form and the cutting off of some, uh, some amino acids will make that peptide chain active. This will bring us now to, we've come to the end, we've uh, described the genetic code, given its features, we've uh, gone through the translation process from the initiation, the elongation, and the termination, and we formed the polypeptide chain, which has undergone uh, modifications. So now uh, we're done with translation. We can uh, look at some revision questions. So the first question says differentiate between the genetic code and the code. Okay. So we covered this in the discussion. We said the genetic code is a sequence of uh, the nucleotides or the DNA molecule or RNA molecule, which code for a sequence of amino acids. Whereas the code is a sequence of three nucleotides on DNA strand or RNA strand, which will code for a specific amino acid. Then the second one says define a gene. We define the gene as being a segment on a DNA strand, which codes for a polypep polypeptide chain. Describe gene expression. So gene expression, this is where you have the gene on the DNA strand, and this gene will lead to the formation of an mRNA molecule, and that mRNA molecule will then lead to uh, the synthesis of a protein. So that is what uh, gene expression is, where you would have to describe how the mRNA is synthesized from the DNA segment called the gene. And that uh, synthesized mRNA is then used to make a protein. So the fourth one, explain the experiments carried out by Francis and his co-workers to confirm that the genetic code is formed by triplet nucleotides. So what Francis and his co-workers did is that uh, they had that uh, synthesized uh, mRNA molecule. And what they did is that they first took out one base pair and they found that the polypeptide chain that was formed was non-functional. Uh, and then uh, removed uh, another base pair. And what happened was that uh, uh, the reading, the code was sort of shifted and they formed uh, a different a different uh, polypeptide chain. And then Francis and his co-workers, what they noticed is that whenever they added, whenever they added uh, three nucleotides to the mRNA or removed three nucleotides to the mRNA, it didn't affect the, uh, the mRNA, the protein synthesis. The, they had, uh, so if they added at the very end, they added the, three, uh, if in between they added three nucleotides, you'd have somewhere along the polypeptide chain, you'd have uh, an amino acid, which wasn't in the original one, but you'd also have the other amino acids. In, whereas if they removed just one, you'd have a non-functional polypeptide chain forming, or when they removed two, they would have a non-functional polypeptide chain uh, forming. That's what they did uh, basically. So uh, maybe you can just uh, research on them, but that was basically what they did. So they tried removing one and they found the, that it was affected. Whereas when they added three nucleotides, you'd have uh, a different amino acid added at some point and the peptide chain would be different. And if they removed, if they removed three, you'd still have a polypeptide chain forming, but you'd have a missing amino acid. That's what Francis and his co-workers did. Uh, question five says, calculate the number of possible combinations that can arise from a triplet codon. Uh, 
uh, using the four nucleotides of RNA and comment on the significance of this number. So you have four possible nucleotides uh, in RNA. You have adenine, you have, uh, oh, you have adenine, you have uh, cytosine, you have uracil, and you have uh, guanine. Those are the four nucleotides you will find in nRNA. And these four nucleotides, uh, the, the codons that code for the amino acids, they will contain three of those, uh, of those uh, nucleotides. So you have four, pos uh, four possible uh, bases, and then you have uh, a codon which contains three bases. So when you raise the number four to the power three, the number you get is 64. And the significance of this number is that you have 60, uh, 64 possible codons. And amongst those 64 codons, if you remember, we had three which code for stop codons. You are away, you are gone, you go away. UAA, UGA, uh, UAG, those stop codons. So when you remove those three stop codons, what you get is that you have 61 codons that code for amino acids and three that code for stop codons. That's the significance of the, the number, the 64. Uh, that's how you answer question five. Question six says explain four features of the genetic code. We went through the eight features of the genetic code, which were that uh, it is universal, it's a triplet codon, uh, it is comalous, non-overlapping, uh, the collinearity, the gene parity, and then we had uh, we had the redundancy or degeneracy. Oh yeah, it is also non-ambiguous. So those were the eight, and I explained on those. So you can, exp I believe you are able to explain the, you're ex able to explain four of those features. Uh, question says, seven says, how many amino acids does each three base triplet on the mRNA molecule code for? So the three base triplet the, in this question is the codon. And each of those codon will code for a single amino acid. Question eight says, start this, uh, state the start codon and mention the amino acid that it codes for. So the start codon will always be AUG, which in uh, prokaryotes will code for uh, formal methionine, F, F methionine, whereas in eukaryotes it will code for uh, methionine. In uh, prokaryotes, AUG, if it's at the, uh, the start point of the translation, it will code for F methionine. But if it's encountered along the chain again, what it will code for will be methionine. Question nine says, what do the three codons, three codons, UAA, UAG, UGA code for? Uh, these, these, code, these three are stop codons, as Elia mentioned. Explain the role played by these codons during protein synthesis. So, in protein synthesis, once the translation apparatus reaches any of these codons, the uh, translation process will stop. You have uh, you have a release factor come to bind to these three, and once that release factor is bound, uh, the polypeptide chain will detach from the complex, and then you have uh, the whole complex dis dissociate. Question 10 says, uh, state three differences between DNA replication and transcription. Uh, this was covered in the uh, DNA replication tutorial and the transcription tutorial. I believe you are able to answer this one. Why is the DNA molecule referred to as the blueprint for protein synthesis? So it's referred to as the blueprint because the DNA sequence will determine the mRNA sequence that is synthesized. 
and that mRNA uh, sequence will determine the amino acid sequence in the polypeptide chain. That is why the DNA molecule is referred to as the blueprint for protein synthesis. Discuss post-transcriptional modification. So the post-transcriptional modifications were discussed in the transcription the tutorial where we mentioned that there will be three, that will be the five prime capping. You have the polyandulation, the addition of the poly A tail, and then you also have the splicing, the removal of the introns. Question 13, what is the role of the promoter site during transcription? Uh, this was also discussed in the transcription uh, uh, tutorial where the promoter sequence is just a sequence where the RNA polymerase will go attached. Describe the structure of each mature prokaryotic RNA. Uh, when discussing the structures of the RNA molecules, I discussed about the prokaryotic RNA, which will have a five prime and translated region then it will have a coding sequence, and at the end, it will have, uh, it will have a three prime uh, and translated region. In the eukaryotes, apart from the whole structure, you, you have at the five prime end, you have a five prime cap, and then at the three prime end, you also have included in the structure a poly A tail. Question 15. Explain the role of each prokaryotic RNA. We we've, we explained on that. Differentiate between introns and exons and mention the type of RNA in which they are found. So question 16, the introns, these are the sequences on the synthesized uh, mRNA that don't uh, code for any amino acids. The exons are the ones that code for the amino acids and that is why you have Amongst the post transcriptional modifications, you have the splicing to remove the introns which don't code for the amino acids. And the RNA which will have this will be the mRNA. Which part of a ribosome contains tRNA molecule that is attached to a growing polypeptide chain? That's the large subunit of the ribosome. Question 18 during translation. An mRNA molecule has a codon with a triplet sequence. At the five prime end, you have A, U, C. Uh, write the anti codon sequence. So, for the anti codon sequence, uh, in the tRNA molecule above this sequence, uh, bonded to the A, you'd have U. Bonded to the U, you'd have A. Bonded to the C, you'd have G. Name the amino acid uh, carried by this tRNA, AUC. So AUC, you'd have to look at the genetic code. So AUC, which is right here, AUC will code for isoleucin. You don't have to memorize the genetic code for questions such as this one. It will be provided. Uh, write the corresponding uh, sequence on the DNA from which the mRNA was transcribed. So this is an mRNA sequence. So for the template strand, you just uh, do the same uh, base pairing. So you have at this five prime end, on the DNA strand, it will be the three prime N. And what you have in the DNA, this A will be bonded to a T there. Uh, this U will be bonded to A. This C will be bonded to G. So you have uh, T, A, G, five, running three prime to five prime. And that will be the, uh, the DNA sequence. Question 19 says, what kind of bonds join amino acids in a polypeptide chain? So these are peptide bonds, which are the formation of which is catalyzed by uh, peptide neutransferase. 
discuss post translational modifications so the post translational modifications which were the cutting off of uh, a sequence of uh, of some amino acids the addition of uh, the addition of functional groups such as addition of glucose glycosylation the addition of lipids lipidation the addition of uh, methyl methylation you could also have an acetyl group added to the polypeptide chain which will be acetylation and we said this will help in the folding of the protein uh, for some poly proteins uh, these post translational modifications will uh, will transform them from their inactive form to their active form and then uh, we also said it can be used uh, in regulation uh, signaling where the polypeptide chain is supposed to go whether it's supposed to go to the uh, to the membranes and so on. question 21 says differentiate the functions of the three types of RNA we've mentioned this we have the mRNA which will have the uh, nucleotide sequences the codons which will code for amino acids you have the tRNA which will be bringing in the amino acids and you have the R uh, ribosome, which will be the site for the protein synthesis, to be the one which will be moving, uh, aligning itself with the codons so that uh, an amino acid can come into its different compartments. So that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, do you have any questions before we end uh, the session? Um, what is the function of the anticodon? The anticodon. Okay, let me go back to this slide. So you have this tRNA molecule and you have this anticodon arm. So this anticodon arm, uh, whereas in the mRNA, you have the codons, the three, um, the sequence which is made up of the three base, uh, bases. In the anticodon, you also have you also have them grouped in three. And what these do is that they will, uh, if you look at this in the initiation, uh, where's the initiation slide? Okay. So if you look at this, this here is the tRNA. And down here, this is the anticodon arm. And this sequence, UAC, is the anticodon. Here on the mRNA, what you have is the codon. So the codon, using the complementary base pairing, will pair with the anticodon in the tRNA. So in the mRNA, you have AUG, which is the start codon. In the tRNA, A will bond to U. U will bond to A, G will bond to C. So this anticodon is what is found on the tRNA. And you have uh, you have uh, a specific anticodon which represents uh, a specific amino acid. I don't know if that makes sense. So the anticodon is the one which bonds to the codon. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Any other questions? Mm, no, I doubt. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Hope to see you in the next session.